Between the 6th and 5th centuries BC, in a town called Ilea, south of Naples, lived a thinker who is also said to have been a physician and a naturalist, Parmenides. Before him, other Ionic philosophers like Thales, Anaximenes, and Anaximander had already inquired into the principle, the Arche, believed to have given origin to the universe. There were thus a number of cosmological hypotheses concerning the primordial elements which had supposedly given rise to the reality of all things. Parmenides, however, represents a radical change of direction with respect to these earlier hypotheses. Could you tell us why this is? Well, because Parmenides went a step beyond these first attempts at clarification and explanation of the universe. That is, he asked himself, what is the whole? What is the being or essence of the whole? We talk about the origin of the universe, but what was there before? Nowadays we are faced with the same problem with the Big Bang, when scientists tell us about this original explosion from which everything started. And we non-experts ask, but what was there before that? The physicists then smile, but our question remains. Well, Parmenides also asked the same question we ask today. What was there before? And he said, there was nothingness. But what does that mean? This is Parmenides' question. Professor Gadamer, what is the true meaning of the term philosophy? Our use of the term philosophy is really a modern one, going back into the 17th century, when the concept of modern science took its place alongside that of the total knowledge of mankind. In the history of thought, there is a single exception to this use of the word philosophy, and it was not among the Greeks as a whole, but uh, rather only with Plato. Only Plato said it is not knowledge, but rather striving for knowledge that sets man apart. That is why the wise man, the sophos, is the Greek ideal. Plato was the only one to say, this ideal is more than men have any right to expect, since they are always underway in search of knowledge. This ideal is what is really connected to the belief in progress of modern research. It is very interesting that a truly balanced culture does not believe in unlimited progress, but rather in the maintenance of order. When we asked you to tell us about the differentiation of science and philosophy, your answer mainly centered on science. Could you now please tell us when they came to be separated? I believe there is a good answer to that. And it is the one Socrates provided us with. Cicero said it was Socrates who brought philosophy back down from the heavens, from astronomy and the workings of nature, back down to the man in the street with the question, how should we act? That seems to me to be the beginning of the separation of a theoretical stance from a practical one. What should we do or not do in order to build a reasonable, a good, a happy life? Um ein vernünftiges und gutes, glückliches Leben aufbauen zu können. For I spend all my time going about trying to persuade you, young and old, 
to make your first and chief concern not for your bodies, nor for your possessions, but for the highest welfare of your souls. Proclaiming as I go, wealth does not bring goodness, but goodness brings wealth and every other blessing, both to the individual and to the state. The Western form of thought is dominant today. In your view, is this due only to technical development or also to the fact that philosophical reflection is well established in Western thought? It has indeed been decisive in the life of the mind that our destiny was shaped by the dominance of European Western civilization. Certainly, it was the Greek beginnings that created such things as mathematics and proof of mathematical truths. That ideal of proof existed in no other culture. It first developed in Greece and was then revived and put on new foundations in modern times in the 17th century. In that respect, the Greeks sired our civilization. <laughs> to our good fortune, they sired our civilization. Because fortunately the Greeks were not only a scientifically gifted people, they had as well a strong feeling for humanity and for the fortunes and joy of life. And that is something we can still learn anew from them. Our human passion for theory and our use of reason in practical matters are not two entirely separate things. Both involve abilities that have been part of us since time immemorial. One is the ability to ask a question and then to hold on to that question so that we can seek an answer rather than simply expect an immediate one. The term for that is research. I happen to believe that you need that in practical matters as well as theoretical ones. Anyone who acts looks for the right means to achieve goals. Thus, practical reason and theoretical reason are one and the same. At the beginning of all this stands our primordial ability to step back from the immediate stimuli of the world, to want a future. And that means asking questions.